This week's episode of our show is sponsored by Dungeon Fog. This highly intuitive map making tool is perfect for dungeon masters looking to create gorgeous battle maps for their tabletop role playing games. We were blown away by how quickly we could create gorgeous homebrew battle maps using Dungeon Fog, from multi level dungeons to natural environments and more. You can finish all your prep work right in Dungeon Fog itself with its very powerful annotation and note taking tools, and then print the maps out to use at your tabletop export a high resolution image that you can import into a virtual tabletop or even connect dungeon fog to your tv or projector and use it with a fog of war mode right at the table a premium subscription gets you access to over 3,000 high resolution props textures and assets to add more detail to your maps with new assets being added every month follow the links in the description below or visit dungeonfog.com to try creating a new dungeon for your next game session and now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the, the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking a look at our methods for quickly building and homebrewing battle-ready, non-player characters for D&D 5e. Creating homebrewed and customized NPCs really allow you to bring a unique element into your adventure, creating your own characters with their own stories and their own way of working in combat. Building a custom NPC ensures that their mechanics in a combat encounter reflect the unique personality character elements, and storyline that you've created for them. So when your player characters finally get to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, they feel that their villainous attributes of a character match the abilities they're bringing to bear in combat too. It's tempting when you're creating an NPC to use the rules in the player's handbook that are designed for creating player characters, but these can actually be really time-consuming and take a lot more effort than is required to create a good, prominent NPC. Also, it can lead to some balancing issues as the rules are designed for the players and not necessarily optimized for NPC characters. Kelly and I have our great methods for quickly building NPCs that really only take five to 10 minutes, letting you go from concept in your mind right to the game table very, very quickly. These methods are so efficient that once you get the handle on using them, you will even be able to use these methods for inventing NPCs on the fly at the table in an improvisational way. This is a really fast and efficient way of making characters and custom NPCs, so let's get rolling. So to get started, one of the most time efficient ways to create a homebrewed NPC is to start with a template. And this involves looking into the Monster Manual or Volo's Guide to Monsters, which actually have a lot of resources for stat blocks that we can use as a beginning step for designing our homebrew NPC. The appendixes of Volo's Guide to Monsters and the Monster Manual, and to a lesser extent, Mordenkind's Tome of Foes, and many of the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons official modules, and a slew of third-party content, have a ton of stat blocks for generic NPCs that you can use as a resource. Many of these NPC stat blocks have abilities, features, and traits that are modeled after the core and iconic abilities available to player characters, but they're just framed and presented in a way that makes them very easy for a dungeon master to use. If we look at some of the simple stat blocks, like the Mage, the Gladiator, or the Master Thief, these are actually great templates to get started. The Mage lends itself very well to almost any spellcaster you want to create. The Gladiator is a melee combatant that you can use as a great template, and the Master Thief is perfect for a roguish skirmisher. So even with these three stat blocks alone, you already have some great templates to really branch out in a lot of creative directions. There are stat blocks in the full range of challenge rate ratings for humanoid NPCs. Most of them range from as low as CR 1 half, like the Scout and the Thug, all the way up to CR 12, like the Archmage, the Archdruid, and the Warlord. In fact, Volo's Guide to Monsters has a huge range of NPCs that follow along the lines of specialist wizards like Evokers, Necromancers, and 
abjurers, even having stat blocks for warlocks of different patrons, bards, and even martial art, arts adepts that are suited for monk-like characters. You even have great options like the Knight Veteran or the Swashbuckler or Archer, which can make easy templates to get started from. While there is a diverse range of challenge ratings covered in these books, you can also very easily adjust any of these NPC set blocks by increasing their hit points and giving them an extra attack in order to increase their challenge rating or removing their attacks and removing hit points to lower their challenge rating to suit the, the specific needs of the encounter and NPC that you're building. By and large, you don't need a lot of features and traits to capture the feeling of an NPC to the player characters. It really is much more about the presentation and role-playing during the encounters that you the players have with this NPC than the specifics of their abilities. We can go a little bit further than this, but I find 90% of the time, this is all I need to do to create a convincing NPC that feels like a player character. Most of the time, you can get away with using the stat blocks as is and just adding in your own role play elements, especially if these are pretty low level NPCs or NPCs that maybe aren't the main NPCs of the campaign. If you are creating an NPC and you're not 100% sure that it's ever going to get into a combat situation with the party, then you may just be able to stop here, grab a stat block, exchange a few quick things, and you're ready to go. You don't need to do any more work than that, especially if you're not sure it's going to come up. Now, if you are creating a special NPC, a prominent character in your campaign, such as a villain or adversary, you still might want to go a little bit further than this and add some new abilities to make them truly unique. This is actually very easy to do because... Really, there's no problem in just cherry picking the abilities from whatever player character class you want to emulate or whatever monsters you want to use and just adding them to the NPC. Choosing one or two subclass or class abilities and tacking them onto the monster are a great way to make it feel more unique and really dive into what this character feels like when they perform in battle. By choosing a ability from your favorite rogue subclass to tack on to the master thief, you've now created a more diverse character that feels unique and interesting at the table. In the case of the NPC mage, we might give it one of the traits from the wizard specialist schools, or maybe even change its spellcasting ability to charisma and give it one or two meta magic choices that it can use once per day. That way we've built a sorcerer or a specialist wizard. In the case of the gladiator, we might give it some of the maneuvers from the battle master, or maybe even tack on spell casting to make it into an eldritch knight. No matter what you choose to do, using this method is so much faster than building an NPC from the ground up. Simply by taking a stat block and tacking on a few abilities, this should only take you a few minutes and now your NPC is ready for the battlefield. The Dungeon Master's Guide has a ton of rules for designing NPCs, villains, and the like, and you can find that on page 274 of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Now, the rules here are great, but they are much more time consuming. So if you want a quicker way to do this, follow our rules of the stat block and tacking on a few things and you're off to the races. And if you want a few more traits that you can use from monsters as well, page 280 of the Dungeon Master's Guide has a giant table of monstrous traits that are used throughout the monster manual that you can use as inspiration for tacking onto your NPCs. Even if your NPCs aren't monstrous in nature, having the traits and abilities from monsters can help add to that distinctiveness and make them more unique. This also spares you from worrying about the minutia of leveling up a character, of making sure that they have their ability score increases coming in at the right time, that they have hit dice that match their spellcasting ability. Those sorts of things are important for player characters and making sure the players are balanced, but it really doesn't matter for a lot of NPCs. If you're trying to assess, have I added too much to this monster and increased its challenge rating? The key thing here to ask yourself is, did you give the monster an ability that increased its damage output or gave it more defenses? For example, if you gave your gladiator NPC the barbarian rage ability, you've definitely made it tougher and increased its damage output. So you should probably change its challenge rating. Usually, 
you can as much as double a monster's defensive capabilities and a monster's damage output, and that might still only bump up its challenge rating by two or three. If you've just given a minor increase to the the NPC's damage output, perhaps you gave it Divine Smite, that might only increase its challenge rating by one. Adding one or two abilities is usually good enough because there are other options to increase the power and threat level of your NPCs and make them more unique and interesting. The abilities isn't the only way to go here. Another great tool that you can use is select a cool magic item and give that to the NPC. Not only does this create a more interesting option for combat, but also you get to describe the cool magic item. It brings a lot of depth to the character and gives the players a cool thing to fight for. After all, there's no better treasure than that which you pried from the cold, dead hands of your defeated enemies. That said, when I am giving magic items to my monsters, NPCs, and other foes, I try to avoid the boring magic items. The ones that just give magic resistance, or plus two to AC, or increase their damage and attack rolls. These magic items are very passive, and oftentimes it's very difficult for the player characters to recognize that the NPC is using one of these magic items, or properly assess exactly how that magic item is affecting their abilities. I like to choose magic items like flaming swords and stabs and tools, things that give the monster an active power to use in the midst of battle. There's nothing quite so special about being able to loot a magic item from a monster that it used against you and then turn it against your next enemies in the next encounter. One of my favorite examples is giving a mage the Staff of Power. If you have a prominent villainous mage, this is a great magic item. Not only does it give them a slew of extra spells to cast, but as soon as the players realize that that enemy has a Staff of Power, they also realize that they need to get that Staff of Power out of the enemy's hands before they can snap it over their knee in front of them, ending the encounter. Having blown up a few staffs of power in the faces of my player characters, I can say that this is a surefire ticket to a memorable encounter, particularly for a vengeful and vindictive villain. But there's plenty of more excellent magic items that can transform the encounter in unexpected ways. Sometimes villains might have cloaks of invisibility, or they might toss out a Darren's instant fortress, or they might have a elemental gem that they can use to summon some more allies, or a horn of Valhalla. All these cool magic items that villains can use to create a new circumstance in the midst of battle lead to memorable encounters and really, really unique challenges for the players too. One of the most time-consuming elements when you are creating an NPC is going to be swapping out your spells. But this is also where you can get a lot of that flavor into your NPC and really customize them to feel the way you want them to feel. We have a few tricks for how to properly swap out your spells and what you should look for when you're choosing. Spellcasting NPCs and monsters are amongst the most difficult to prepare, plan, and play. And it's really easy to think about the spells that an NPC would prepare as if they were a player character. But the mindset of preparing spells for an NPC that the players are going to fight is very different from the mindset that player characters want to take when they're preparing their spells. There are certain spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that are really excellent for the player characters to use, but not so good for NPCs. Vice versa, there are some spells that are amazing at creating challenges for player characters, even though they might not be the favorite spells for player characters themselves to use. So there is an interesting counterbalance here because not all spells are created equally when it comes to being used both by and against the player characters. So let's go over a rule of thumb for how to pick some spells for your NPC. First of all, you're going to want one spell to concentrate on. Maybe a second one if the fight can go in a few different ways. It might be nice to have these options if you foresee this NPC lasting a while or participating in more than one combat encounter. Battlefield control spells such as Cloud Kill, Wall of Fire, Web, Spirit Guardians, and Wall of For Force are amongst the most interesting options to pose a challenge to the player characters. I am not a fan of using concentration spells that buff an enemy 
Enemies tend to take a lot of hits in battle and lose concentration on that protective buff spell. And spells like Hypnotic Pattern and Hold Person that take player characters out of the fight tend to just shut things down without creating an interesting challenge. So when I'm choosing my concentration spells for my NPCs, I generally gravitate towards these interesting battlefield control spells which reshape the terrain in an interesting way. Next, you'll want to look at one or two spells that can be cast before the combat starts to buff up your villains. These could be things like Mage Armor, Fire Shield, Mirror Image, or others of that sort. High level spellcasting NPCs should almost always have a contingency spell in place to protect them in the worst case scenarios. There are a lot of really awesome spells that a villainous NPC might be able to take to mess with the party, and we actually do have a video for that right up here. Next, you want to take some damage dealing spells. Even if you are going for the subtle NPC illusionist flavor, I find that basically every spellcasting NPC needs to have a hammer of some kind. I like to load up my spellcasting NPCs with spells such as Fireball, Lightning Bolt, or Cone of Cold, maybe sometimes using other equivalents like Synaptic Static or Shatter as well. Just something that deals damage to a couple of PCs at once really makes sure that any spellcasting NPC poses a credible threat. And using these AoE spells is actually a great way to make sure that you are a threat to the entire party. Rather than spending your turns trying to pick them off one at a time, having a couple AoE spells can really make an impact on the battlefield. You also want to make sure that you have a mixture of spells that use attack rolls and a mixture of spells that cause saving throws. I like to make sure that each of my NPCs uses a damage dealing cantrip with an attack roll, but also that they have spells like Fireball and Lightning Bolt that ask for saving throws because these make sure that you're addressing both party members that have really good saving throws, but not good AC, and party members that have a really high AC still have to worry about that Fireball. Next up, if you are playing a higher level mage who is going to be battling the high level mages of the party, you might want to consider taking counterspell or dispel magic. This will just increase their survivability and be able to shut down that one hit that's going to wipe them out. Counterspell is something that player characters love using against NPCs, but they should have to face the brunt of it once in a while themselves. For spellcasters that do not have access to counterspell, dispel magic can also be a great way to make sure that your battlefield control divination wizard isn't running amok over every single combat encounter. And lastly, give them something like shield or absorb elements that will allow them to take less damage. Most spellcasters are going to be pretty squishy, and this is generally their downfall when you're new to D&D and trying to create an NPC wizard. There's a lot of disappointment when that wizard spellcaster villain falls in combat after one or two rounds, especially if it's a late game boss battle. So by giving them things like shield or absorb elements, you're actually increasing the chance that they can survive for a few extra rounds, showing that they're a credible threat. Finally, if you do want to create a recurring villain, you better make sure that you've packed along a spell that will help them escape, like Invisibility, Dimension Door, or perhaps even Teleport or Plane Shift. Just be careful about using spells such as these because you don't want to rob the player characters from a hard-earned victory. All of the spells that we just mentioned are great tools and assets that you can use to make a prominent spellcasting NPC in Dungeons & Dragons. But there are also a few things that you may want to avoid when you're creating these spell-swapped characters. First of all, you want to avoid loading up your NPCs with a bunch of concentration spells. If all you give your NPCs are concentration spells and cantrips, then basically on the first round of combat, they start their spell that they're going to concentrate on, and then they're reduced to using cantrips for the rest of the battle, unless they want to change out their concentration spell. Making sure that you have a good mix of both concentration and non-concentration spells, and in fact really loading up more heavily on those non-concentration based spells, helps build a more credible threat in an encounter. Also be aware that healing spells may not be as effective as you had hoped for your NPCs. Villains, monsters, and the like tend to take a lot of damage in a round of combat, especially if they're the prominent focal point and the whole party's going to be dishing out damage towards them. Having a couple healing spells might not give you that extra oomph and will actually end up wasting the turn trying to heal people up where they're going to end up losing those hit points pretty quickly anyway. 
anyway. So you may not get the punch that you wanted out of a healing spellcaster as a villainous NPC. In my experience, using healing spells in combat in Dungeons & Dragons 5e is like put, trying to put a band-aid over a bullet hole. And player characters in D&D 5e deal a lot of damage and deal it really, really quickly. Oftentimes, it's better for the NPCs to be aggressive back at the players, and this will create a bigger long-term challenge for the players than trying to win a war of attrition against the players. It just doesn't work well, and it tends to bog down combat and lead to long, boring, and drawn-out fights when the healing is effective, which I just don't think are that exciting. You may also want to avoid single-target damage-dealing spells. AoE is a much more effective way to be prominent on the battlefield and dish out that damage to the entire party. If you're spending every turn dishing out these single target spells, the rest of the party gets to dish out damage on your on your NPC while you're there struggling trying to take one out at a time. It can also go the other way. Some higher level damage dealing spells do deal enough damage to take a player character out entirely. Getting hit by a disintegrate spell, power word kill, or finger of death could just be the end of a player character that fails a saving throw. And so these spells tend to be really swingy in their results. Sometimes that can be really exciting. Sometimes though, it can produce less desirable outcomes. So be a little bit measured when thinking about single target damage dealing spells with your spellcasting villains. Something that I tend to do is if I am creating a high level spellcasting villain, I will give them one of those types of spells like Disintegrate or Finger of Death that they only have one spell slot to use, making it their kind of big guns. And usually I try to pick on the target that actually has enough uh, HP that it has a good chance of probably surviving, but maybe I can knock them down to a weakened state. This is a great way to show that the villainous NPC is strong and powerful, but without decimating the party. That said, I'll never forget the time I had an NPC spellcaster cast Finger of Death on Kelly's wizard, killing him instantly and turning him into a zombie. Yeah, great times. So with all this said, we now have the tools to create a lot of really awesome NPCs. But what happens if you're trying to build up to a prominent boss battle or an end game combat encounter? Maybe this is one of the prominent villains that the party has been pursuing for months. We want to make this a little more interesting. So how can we make our NPCs legendary? Building a legendary monster can seem like a daunting task, but it's actually a lot easier than you might expect. There's a couple really quick steps that you can follow by following the patterns that are in the monster manual. It actually surprises me that the monster manual and Dungeon Master's Guide don't lay out just how easy it is to build a legendary monster, but here's how we do it. So the first thing that you can do is just take their hit points and double them. This will make them beefy enough that they can take more hits in combat and stand up to the party toe to toe. Don't worry about the hit dice or anything, just double these hit points. In some cases, you may even want to triple them. Next up, think about giving it legendary resistance. Most legendary creatures have legendary resistance and they can use it three times per day. By giving your NPC the same ability, you're now giving it the option to say no to the prominent attacks against it that could wipe it out early. Legendary resistance is usually enough to save your monster from things like Stunning Strike, Banishment, Hold Monster, and Disintegrate. Sometimes you may want to bulk them out a little bit further with resistances to fire damage or lightning damage, or maybe even immunity to things like being charmed and frightened. Beyond that, you don't really need to add too many more resistances, although if your NPC doesn't have uh, proficiency in constitution and wisdom saving throws, you may also want to give them proficiency in those saving throws too. And lastly, all legendary creatures need a few legendary actions, but rather than overcomplicating it and trying to come up with unique and wild ways that you can have legendary actions, there's a few options that are pretty much staples of legendary actions and easy to just take and apply. In general, a creature can use one of its legendary actions to make a melee or ranged attack. If we look across a bunch of monsters in the monster manual, this is a pretty standard give for most monsters. It also works for cantrips as well. So I like to say most legendary monsters, one action, cast a cantrip, make a melee or ranged attack, boom, done. 
Another option that we see very commonly with legendary monsters is for two actions being able to move without provoking an opportunity attack. This just allows your monster to get out of tough situations without getting killed. For higher level monsters and NPCs that have magical abilities, maybe for two legendary actions they get to turn invisible, teleport 60 feet, or perhaps have some other unique movement mode instead. And lastly, for three actions, this is usually where you get a really cool ability to use with your NPC. In this case, a very simple way is if you have a spell casting NPC, just let them use three actions to cast a spell. This will give them a lot more power to be able to make more spell casting attacks per turn against the party. If your NPC isn't a spellcaster, but you want to give them a big gun for their three action legendary action, just copy the features or abilities of a spell and reflavor it into something that sounds like a superpower of some kind. Maybe you have a fire imbued barbarian that casts fireball as a legendary action, but that's just reflavored to them exploding flames out of all the pores of their body. If you add all of these legendary abilities onto your NPC, you may be bumping up their challenge rating by maybe two or three. It's not that big of a jump, but it is something to note. If you're using all of the things we talked about and you are giving them abilities and class features as well as all of these legendary options, you may want to consider how far ahead you're bumping them and what that might look like when your players face off against this NPC. Ultimately, you can make a lot of changes to NPC as long as you're making only one or two small adjustments without needing to worry if you modify their challenge rating at all. Again, ask yourself, did the change that I made cause the creature to deal more damage or make it more tougher and more defensive? If the answer is no, it's kind of a side grade, then you probably don't need to change the challenge rating. And if you did bump up the challenge rating of the monster, ask yourself, did this increase it by less than 50%? If so, it's probably only a challenge rating change of maybe one or two. If you doubled the creature's damage output, that's when you probably do want to go back in a little bit more detailed and make sure how much of a change you've actually made and assess the challenge rating properly using the guidelines in the Dungeon Master's Guide. But these small changes are unlikely to rock the boat in a huge way and really pay off in the amount of prep time that they save when you're getting ready for the next game night. So this has been a look at quick tips for homebrewing battle-ready NPCs in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Tell us about some of the coolest NPCs that you've created in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the generosity of our incredible Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do on our show, please consider joining our Patreon and becoming a part of our community. You can find out more by following the links in the description below or at patreon.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. And don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can also find all of the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more awesome tips and tricks for Dungeon Masters and D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in the dungeon.